Great. Uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Nelson. I'm a senior digital finance advisor with USAID and the Innovation Technology and Research Hub, uh, headquarters unit focused on digital technology. Uh, thanks for attending our afternoon session, whether you're online or in the room. Um, we have a really good panel here drawn from the public sector, academia, the humanitarian space, and the World Bank system. And as you all know from the prompt for the session, we're here to talk about the risks and rewards of partnering with tech firms. Uh, I think the general theme of FDDF is to have a little bit more uh, candid discussion regarding certain topics, you know, what works, what doesn't work, and in particular on the what doesn't work front, drawing from the insights from people in the room that have worked with firms in the private sector, uh, worked in firms uh, in the private sector, or uh, you know, studied the impacts of, uh, of firms in the digital economy. So basically, you know, USAID, we have a private sector engagement strategy or policy for a decade and a half. This has been a really uh, uh, significant priority of the agency. Um, we recognize that it's in, they're an indispensable set of stakeholders for advancing development outcomes and addressing humanitarian assistance priorities. Um, you know, that's where a lot of the expertise sits. That's where a lot of the capital sits. That's where a lot of the connections and relationships sit. And in the digital context, that's also where a lot of the technology is developed. Um, we also understand that, you know, the private sector has done a lot to advance development objectives in digital. University-led R&D has uh, led to a lot of fresh insights on community needs, on uh, maybe more advanced technologies like how AI systems can be used to uh, fill information gaps or uh, facilitate really uh, complex uh, data analysis, consumer advocacy groups, which is another perhaps under-recognized uh, part of the private sector uh, community. Uh, consumer advocacy groups, they've also uh, held a lot of public and private sector actors accountable uh, for irresponsible market conduct or harms that endanger, uh, endanger lives. But this panel today, we're talking about industry specifically, industry as a part of the private sector. And what about engagement with commercial firms in the digital economy that uh, design services, they offer products to end users or they invest capital. So at USAID, as I said earlier, we often work with, uh, with industry in particular. Uh, we have a long track record of that. Um, we've worked, for example, with Google to um, build out a fiber optic uh, um, internet connectivity ring around Monrovia and Liberia. We've worked with uh, Mozilla Foundation to uh, um, uh, strengthen the, the integration of a strong ethics backbone and how AI is taught in universities, um, among other things. Despite all that, so that's a lot of people recognize as useful for development objectives. And yet we also know that the digital economy is not always a source of positive outcomes. It can also expose people to risks. It can expose people to harm. Um, in particular, just to touch on a few things that might come up on the panel, uh, you know, there's the irresponsible use of data. There's the risk of cyber attacks. Um, there's the risk of people potentially uh, uh, finding themselves uh, in over their head in terms of debt due to uh, irresponsible digital credit providers, for example. Uh, these are also parts of uh, the digital economy that we have to think about and understand how we can uh, how we can account for. So given those dynamics, how should the development community, how should a lot of you in the room, uh, how should we approach tech partnerships responsibly and avoid planting the seeds for, for harm? So today we'll discuss these issues with the panel. Um, and hopefully, I, again, knowing a lot of the people in the audience, hopefully we can get some hard questions or experiences or observations from you in the room as well, uh, including online. Um, and I just want to frame the conversation with a couple different ways in which firms as IT vendors. So this might be kind of an under-recognized area of impact, the collective impact that the development community and its decisions can have on the local digital ecosystems that we work in by procuring IT services, uh, whether those are from local firms or, or not. Another one is partnering with tech firms as innovators. So that's a great source of you know, fresh ideas, new technology, different business models, testing those things out, determining what works, what doesn't work, we often work with, uh, with industry to figure those things out. Uh, and then lastly is partnering with tech firms when they are acting as market participants. 
So this is when they're in a the country and they're, they're offering services to end users, or maybe they want to do that, but to do that, they first need to address a policy issue that might, for them, prevent them from doing that. And so then that sometimes that's what leads them to collaborate with the, with the, the development community. So in each of those three areas, you know, IT vendors, innovators, market participants, those might give you some ideas of, okay, yeah, there are risks that we need to think about in that area, but maybe not in that area. And what are the lessons that we've uh, learned? And maybe what are the things that we need to talk a little bit more candidly about as a development community? So our panelists, uh, I'll, I'll go from the far end and move, work my way this way. Uh, we have Thomas DeBotz, who's uh, from the State Department, who leads the Office of Global Partnerships. Uh, we have uh, Emily, who's from Georgetown University's, uh, let's see if I say this correctly, Innovation on Tech and Society, and also an adjunct professor for the McCord School for Public Policy and a Siegel Family Endowment Fellow. Uh, Kyriakos, who's with the UN World Food Program and the managing their Innovation Accelerator Program, although currently on sabbatical uh, on a fellowship with Yale. Uh, and then lastly, we, uh, on, the, on stage at least, we have Gayatri Murthy, who's a financial sector specialist with the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, or CGAP, which is housed at the World Bank. Uh, and then on the screen uh, behind me, uh, we have Rebecca joining us from uh, Kenya. And Rebecca is a Mozilla uh, Community Fellow for the Kiswahili Com Common Voice Project. So with the Mozilla Foundation. So I'll first pose the question to Emily. Darn. <laughs> so the question is, is there even a problem? Do we even need to have a panel today to discuss the risks and rewards of partnering with tech firms? Because if there isn't a problem, then let's change the- Let's go home. Wrap this up. Yeah, pack it up. Uh, yes, there is one. Um, and I think, you, I think you framed this very nicely. There are a number of different ways to think about both the problem space, but also, you know, the opportunities that, um, that these companies bring to the table. Of course, we are working with them, um, governments, NGOs, nonprofits, every different level is looking to companies for a reason. They have something to offer. Um, I think the, the problem is, um, in, in my view, one of the primary problems is, is disentangling the incentives uh, and who ultimately all of the different parties are working for and what their bottom line is. Um, as someone who, um, you know, I, pre-Georgetown, I, uh, I helped start the U.S. digital service in the, um, in the U.S. federal government. I helped stand up the first agency level team. And um, one of the things we saw firsthand was both the need for the skills and experiences and technology that come from these firms, but the inherent problem it poses to an organization that is focused on the public interest. Um, because at the end of the day, particularly with vendor relationships, their job is to get another contract their ultimate driver and their incentive is to make money and to get more business, even the best versions of those vendors. And um, to my mind, that's really where um, both the problem, but also the potential solution is, is in entering those relationships with clear eyes um, and enough knowledge to be able to craft the relationship in a way that sets everyone up for success um, on both sides of the equation. Okay, so now that we've at least established that there might be a rationale for having the panel, <laughs> I'll do a quick round, round robin and ask each of you in turn. Coach or think about partnerships with tech firms, what would those takeaways be? And they need not go into too much detail, but. Uh, we'll just start with you, uh, Thomas, and work our way down. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, great insight on that. Uh, I think that if there are two things, the first, the first question is how do you define tech? Back in the days when I started at the department, when we talked about tech companies, you we were talking about the big companies, Googles and all of them. Now it's astounding to me that I was in Miami recently and I was talking to a, a bank. 
And I was talking about how financial service, you know, their bank, they, they stopped me. It's like, we're not a bank. I'm like, what are you? We are a tech company who happened to provide financial services. <laughs> so everybody's flipping the script in terms of what tech, because tech is now everywhere. Everyone is using technology to provide those things. So I think the definition of what tech companies mean is vastly different. Um, so that's one thing, because when you are approaching uh, organizations from a, from a Department of State perspective, from a public good perspective, the way we approach companies is not for the sake of tech, it's for the sake of the problem we're trying to solve. Because the partnership is a means to an end. Sometimes people come at me and say, I want to do partnership with tech companies. For what? I don't know, but I really want to do that. And so the first thing you need to do is the, your why. You need to start with why. Why am I engaging with these organizations? What value do they bring to the table? And the most important part, and this is the problem for us, for the U.S. state and state, is we don't even know what value we bring, we bring to the table. So unless, yeah. the, unless the ping pong game works quite well, it is going to be you playing a different sport if you, when you're engaging with them. I think the first thing is let's define what the tech company is. What value do they bring to the table to solve the specific problem we're trying to address mm -hmm. rather than kumbaya for the sake of kumbaya? And the second one is due diligence, meaning, uh, you know, not, not everybody has, it's kosher. Not everybody is good for you to engage with. And how do you weigh the risk and rewards of collaborating with certain institutions who might bring value to the table, but the burden of working with them might outweigh that value? So figuring that formula out is always, it's more of an art than a science, frankly. There's no data that I can show you. This is how you do it. But I think those are the two things, at least that comes to my mind um, from that. Thanks. Maybe I'll go ahead and I'm Sure. Um, so building on that, I love what you said about essentially focusing on the outcome. What's the policy outcome that you want? And I think a lot of um, the relationships we have, whether they are, you know, public-private partnerships or um, contracts or whatever they might be, um, they have to start, you have to define it in some form. And a lot of our processes internally force us to focus on the solution rather than the outcome. So we have to be able, we're, we're all incentivized to essentially create like a checklist to hold people accountable, right? Uh, did you, we, we said we wanted the following 10 things or 10 specifications in a product that we're going to have. You have to decide those things years in advance and reality changes, as we know, um, once you start doing that work. And I think for, especially for the folks in this room and um, doing work uh, in international development, but honestly, everywhere, don't focus on the solution. Focus on the outcome you want and be open to exploring what the best um, what the best product or policy or program, what the best solution could be and make the solution essentially part of that discovery process. So that would be thing one is like prioritize the outcome, not the solution. And two is um, another version basically of People, people are policy, right? Um, to craft an effective relationship and manage an effective relationship with any kind of tech, tech firm, especially in the private sector, uh, tech team, I should say, especially in the private sector, you really need people who understand enough about that technology and in, about the space on your team helping you craft that vision and candidly, can I curse? Can I curse? Yeah. Um, to like, to be your bullshit meter, mm -hmm. right? You need a bullshit meter at your table and you need one that knows the technology well enough to help you sniff out snake oil, to help you identify mischaracterizations, um, shortcuts, et cetera. Those are things that are hard for subject matter experts or people who like live and breathe in the work on the ground to know. And this sort of ties to a little pet peeve of mine, which is, you know, I think we put a lot of pressure on people in development and in other parts of government to like be experts in tech or to know more about tech. And candidly, I don't know that we should, right? Like we need both at the table and our outcomes are stronger 
when we get more people with that technical experience um, at the table. Maybe Kiriakos, can I skip you and go to Rebecca and then come back? Uh, Rebecca, would you like to uh, take a crack at the uh, at the two takeaways that you'd share? Sure. I think the missing the missing element to all of this is, but I would say uh, the community part of it. So. If we're going to have to sort of solve this kind of complex puzzle, according to how I see it, the missing part we definitely has to come from the community. If we're going to bridge that gap between solution and the outcomes, then we need the community to be part of that process. Because even the people that we speak about building partnership with tech firms do need the participation of the communities, the understanding of the kind of context and the communities that they come from. From this, I talk about things like social context, the cultural context, uh, are the tech firms building the kind of technology that actually speaks to the context of these communities that they're serving? That's the part where part of making sure that they are part of that process, they're engaged in it from the very initial stages is an effort that different actors need to make sure to push that engagement. Because most of the time for tech firms, it's all about bringing out a technology and then putting out there to the people and then the communities have to kind of consume that product. But then the outcome of it cannot be realized unless the community is part of that process because you can only understand what the community needs and if that solution will work to bring the kind of outcome that they're looking for if they're part of the process. So for me, I think a critical part to evaluate the risk and rewards to it is how much the community has been involved, how much the tech communities can keep engaging communities throughout the process. And what are the different actors, because we're talking of kind of a multi-stakeholder kind of approach, what are different actors bringing to the table that can push the big tech firms that we talk about to be able to represent the needs of the community and not just serve out or dish out some kind of a product to the communities. So for me, I think the weighing of how much the community is participating in that process of building technology is much a key towards ensuring that we're able to balance that weighing scale between the risk and rewards and how we can engage different actors when it comes to working with the, the big tech firms. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Kiriakos, how about you? Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so I think in my experience, and then just building off what Emily and Thomas have said, is I've always asked myself, could I do more with the private sector versus doing it alone, whether that was at USAID or in my current role at WFP? And the key piece of that is also looking at what is the outcome or what is the problem that I'm trying to solve or what is the problem that I'm trying to tackle. And I've been actually pleasantly surprised that even in having preliminary conversations with some of the tech partners that I've worked with, they've also been very um, critical of what it is that we're trying to get out of this partnership. And, and thankfully, at least my counterparts in, in the tech sector have, have been less about driving the tech or pushing the tech, but more about looking at the potential impact of the problem being solved. Having said that, I do, the second, I guess, takeaway is um, don't underestimate how much effort and time and agony it takes to build these partnerships and to actually get real value out of it. Um, as Thomas said, one, you have to know what you're bringing to the table because they will ask and they will want to know very explicitly what is your role in this collaboration. And secondly, um, again, in my experience, as much as I, I might complain about the bureaucracy at the UN or at USAID, big tech has their own uh, machinery that you have to also navigate, work with, and contend with. So bringing together uh, two big players uh, or multiple big players can be quite cumbersome. And sometimes you realize I would have rather not done this at all. Mm -hmm. The last point I'll make um, is the distinction between a vendor and a partner. And that's mm -hmm. something that we are very mindful of, especially at the World Food Program, because for us, it is very important that we don't uh, pick favorites or we don't endorse a specific product or service. And so, if we do have a vendor relationship with a tech company, then that is uh, very explicit. And the, the partner in, in question is not allowed to mention that they are working with the WFP because they are in effect being paid to offer that service or product. So it would be unfair for them to claim a partnership when indeed they're just being paid for a service. And so um, I think that's a, a, an important distinction to be made because you can use that as leverage, uh, the, the whole idea of partnership 
can be used as leverage when having conversations with potential partners. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I was thinking what I should add in uh, addition to what everyone has said here so wonderfully. Um, so I think by way of background, uh, my engagement with technology as someone who works for the World Bank uh, and for a small think tank within it um, is I've been working at the kind of intersection of what low-income communities need when it comes to finance and financial services and how can we build kind of tech-enabled business models to bring that to life in a kind of viable market-led way. And so in the last few years, my, my work has taken me to partnering with fintechs, which is, you know, as we defined as a tech company, you know, something we have to understand in the world of tech, um, as well as gig work platforms and, and some of these other places that are really digitizing the world of work and life of low-income communities. And I think what I've learned about partnering with technology companies um, in that space in general falls into these kind of three buckets, if you will. So the first thing is, um, I think the, the, the opportunity and decimation of the last 20 years that the world has gone through, I mean, it shows us that the emerging market reality is a new reality, right? So my work has been in the cities of India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, and a lot of what's happening there in technology is actually something we need to learn from. So I think, especially in the world of innovation and market-led solutions, what I've learned about partnerships is that the development sector, especially Western, folk, you know, Western-led development, has a lot to learn from what's happening on the ground. I mean, the work happening with the next billion populations around the world is truly something that's indigenous, um, I think novel, and worth, I think, us understanding well. So kind of putting on that learning hat, right? But at the same time, I think we as the development world have something to bring to this new tech world of, of the emerging world, which is, I think we have to continue teaching about what works for low-income communities. Because just because technology shows up in Mumbai or Jakarta in some form doesn't mean it's automatically inclusive. Right. So I think as the development community, some of the lessons we've learned on participatory development, on being kind of leading big structural programs, I think we need to teach the tech world that as well. So there is still a teaching component. I think it's not all about us following the next big startup in India or Kenya. And then third, I think when it comes to the risks bit, I think there's plenty. Embedded, um, embedded finance for gig work. I mean, these are like precarious, precarious spaces that a new segment of the world is entering, right? Without the kind of confidence you and I have about doing online dating and investment on our smartphones with utter confidence that nothing can go wrong. Um, so I think we the support required from the development space is to ensure those risks are managed that low-income communities are protected, business models are sustainable, but at the same time that these startups are supported too in the right way, that there is blended finance when you need it, that um, these innovations are not allowed to just die off because of the lack of local capital. So I think it's a reinvention. The tech partnerships of today in necessary, necessitate, necessitate a, I think, a reinvention of the development sector too as we engage. Great. Um Rebecca, one question for you. You mentioned earlier the issue of uh, how, to what degree the local community needs inform what is done when it comes to partnering with tech firms. If there are instances where you have observed that not happening, could you speak to how you think um, the development community should approach the formation of those partnerships to avoid those trade-offs or, or pitfalls? Yeah, I think the, the development actors have a big role to play in that aspect because one of the key things that they do is represent the communities that they come from and make sure that their interests are well represented. So for me, the first thing I would say, uh, just to echo a point that was made by the previous speaker about them considering things like privacy by design, not default, 
being sort of like the kind of actors that comes in and say, you know, when you're developing this kind of tech or when you're building something around this space, you need to consider factors A, B, C, D for you to make sure that you have that community participation, you have them engaging in the process. But then there's also the whole aspect around how best to represent the community's interest, because most often when we're kind of talking about technological products, we talk about a team of experts that sit in some offices somewhere and come up with a solution. And then they say, OK, we're going to bring this solution and we're going to bring it to the community X and Y. But then the nuances that these communities face are not really represented. When I talk of nuances, I talk of things like language barriers. Uh, you bring high technology, AI power technology to communities that have access challenges. Uh, people have challenges with devices that they use. I've experienced this in, in the projects that we're doing currently at Mozilla on the Common Voice team, where we're working towards building the Kiswahili data set. And sometimes when you're speaking to communities and trying to curate them to be part of the process of building that data set, that it will be open towards building uh, voice data sets or building voice enabled uh, solutions, speech recognition solutions, you find that sometimes when you're engaging the communities, they have a lot of questions in mind. For example, who said that I need to be able to use this application in Swahili because maybe I speak English or people come up with nuances such as, uh, okay, let's talk about my privacy. How do I trust that this tech firm that I'm giving my voice um, donations to is going to use them appropriately? How are you going to ensure that uh, my, anonym, uh, my anonymity is, uh, is protected? Can I be sure that uh, this contribution that I'm making will actually come back to me in a way that will benefit me? Because the challenge with it also comes back to the issue around incentives that was talked about by a previous um, speaker that when tech comes to communities, there's something that they sort of often forget to point out. Best of it is how they're going to incentivize those communities, how those communities are going to benefit from the products that they're building. So when you leave that out, you find that a lot of people don't see a need to participate or even use the technology because there is not something that will be rewarding towards them. So the part for me that I think is very critical when you talk around this aspect of how uh, the development actors uh, access with test firms are maybe aligned with the priorities and the incidents that happen. You find that someone is building a technology, let's say in the agriculture sector, and they bring it out to the communities, but they don't really look around the other determining factors that are essential for them consuming the product that they're bringing forth. So you bring a robot to agriculture firms that don't have power issues. Look about uh, rural communities that have issues with uh, how to use the tech, the language that the tech is coming in. So all these factors are kind of a challenge, a very big challenge when it comes to how best these communities can participate and be part of that process. So for me, I think there's quite a huge uh, element that can be adjusted in this space, especially if we look at how best the interests of the communities can be represented. You. Thank you. Yeah, you froze up just at the end there, but I think we caught you. Um, one issue that does come to mind is the issue of the quest for scale. So development actors are one reason that motivates a, or issue that prompts us to work with the private sector is to achieve scale. We want to work with a lot of communities. And of course, naturally, that means we want to work with the private sector. Um, to do so, to extend our reach and to go into rural communities, et cetera. And, you know, Emily, one thing I would pose to you is, is there a way to approach scale in a way that does not lead us to uh, having certain blind spots regarding who we work with or, you know, what those kinds of partnerships might lead to? No, hard no. Um, I, and I think this is the, it is the promise and the, what's the good word for this? Like the downfall, like one of the Achilles heels of um, technology is that it promises scale. It promises reach. We are talking about people. We are talking about communities that have very particular specific challenges and needs and unique contexts and cultures. And just this like really complex fascinating, very human collection of things happening. And tech can't do that. And scale can't do that. It just can't. Like, I will die on this hill. Like, there is a degree to which technology and scale can be helpful. Um, 
but you have to, and this is where like going in with your eyes wide open is really important. And that all starts with knowing what problem you want to solve, because there are many problems that you cannot solve at scale. They require deeply human approaches that are inherently unscalable. They require, right? Once, what's one of the reasons that like human-centered design and like community partnerships have been so incredibly powerful in development has been because they're the opposite of scale. It's like people sitting in communities observing with like ethnographic style research and tools what is happening, what is the problem in order to craft an effective solution. And I think tech puts us kind of not necessarily intentionally, but I think it feels like this really fun silver bullet that everyone wants and just, in my view, just really doesn't exist in that form. Um, so I think there's a place for scale and I think there's a way to, um, to explore and to have that conversation. But I do think that inherently these are two things that are not particularly compatible. And the last thing I'll say is um, I think that one of the exciting challenges to consider is what does it look like, for lack of a better term, to like scale unscalable, inherently unscalable, high touch um, relationships? Is there a way to multiply that um, that is not quite scale, but that can expand and we can facilitate adoption of this much more high touch process or experience. In the financial services context, that's also come up frequently that uh, digital can be a, a very useful avenue for extending your reach or different types of distribution models, but it doesn't completely negate the imperative for having some sort of human yeah. touch point to help with the customer yeah. engagement or at different points of the customer life cycle. Can I add sure. one more quick thing? And this is like maybe for one of the, for one of the other people up here and on, on screen is the role of friction and the importance of friction, particularly in tech products. We have, we have glorified efficiency and efficiency requires the removal of, um, uh, you know, of friction, like these frictionless environments. And that is a good way to get people in and it has some positive outcomes, but some of the downsides and particularly on the financial sector, you know, you can see the downsides of frictionless products and experiences. And I'm curious in combination with scale, wanted to add that kind of to the mix. Sure. Just to, and yeah, I mean, again, you, having a customer service line that you yeah. can call with a real person on the other end can be a real boon to people having trust in new yeah. digital financial services. I yeah. mean, I'll just yeah. add to that, Paul. Um, if you look at our cash-based transfers um, programming, a lot of it has been facilitated by technology, right? Where we're moving away from just carrying big bags of cash and giving it out. And instead, we're looking at different modalities around digital financial services that can help us reach the numbers that we do, but both to Emily's point and to your point, we still have um, individuals involved and a lot of community organizations involved in reaching out to communities in the registration process, in the customer feedback mechanisms. We always ensure that if there is a friction that uh, anyone receiving cash assistance can talk to a real person and can help them um, resolve whatever issues are being had, not to mention other areas around digital and financial literacy that you still need humans involved. So I think, like you said, technology can be an enabler, but it can't replace everything we do, especially in these very uh, tough environments in which a lot of us are working in. You do need the human element, definitely. And, and technology will always be a part of whatever program you're delivering, but it can never replace the entire thing. So, so one question, I guess, is uh, many people in the room that we, and besides managing development programs or working on the private sector side, one theme for today and tomorrow is innovation. So because it's frontiers of digital development. So frontiers, meaning things that might not yet be proven, newfangled business models, newfangled technologies. We don't know what'll work or what will or won't. Um, 
should we approach risk differently for those kinds of things? So for example, the perpetual quest for scale without negative side effects, uh, should we have a, should we approach risk or have a, a, a different mindset about risk when it comes to working with tech firms specifically focused on innovation? So the WFP innovation accelerator, you, you understand that you're maybe dealing with unproven technologies or working with unproven providers of those technologies. So do you think of it in a totally different way than you do if you are in, in another part of WFP and you're just procuring a vendor and hopefully that's a vendor that has a good track record? Right. So I guess if I could reframe the question, do we have a higher risk tolerance within the innovation unit than, than the rest of the organization? In, in some ways we do, but the beginning and, and the end of everything we do, we adhere to the do no harm principle. And when working with unproven technologies within the innovation accelerator, one, we always start small, super small, to make sure that um, what we're testing can be contained and there's always uh, different um, mitigation measures taken into account. To Rebecca's point, we always partner with local organizations and we always ensure that whatever technology is being considered is always um, developed with a local context in mind. So we always work both with our local country office counterparts and then through them with local community um, organizations to make sure that we are being informed and that ultimately those who will be benefiting and using whatever technology is being considered um, are informing the design of it. Um, and so we take small steps to reduce the risk until the point where we feel comfortable that we can deploy this further. And that's not something that, oops, sorry, that we as an innovation unit will determine in and of ourselves, right? Um, on our advisory board, we have senior staff across WFP that ensure that what we're doing um, is commensurate to the risk that we might be taking. We have our IT division who is ultimately responsible for um, developing anything at the product level and ensuring um, at the enterprise level that things are robust as well. So there's a lot of different stakeholders that have to come into play and that have to um, opine on, on whether or not what we're doing warrants the risk. Having said that, that also creates a lot of friction because if you're in an innovation unit, you do want to try different things and you do want to be experimental, but you definitely do it in a safe, uh, um, safe manner. But you also want to do, do it fast enough so that you can realize if this doesn't work, we drop it and we move on to something else. And so there's a constant dialogue that needs to be had both with the different divisions within our organization, but especially with our colleagues on the ground to ensure that we communicate the potential value and that they communicate very clearly the real risks and harm that can, can come out of some of the work that we're doing. So I think one thing to say there or take away is that it's in the innovation unit, it's not blind to risk, it's cognizant of risks, which allows you to know where you want to direct your, your kind of inquiry or line of thought. Exactly. Um, There's one thing I wanted to add to that. And I think um, another risk we seem to see in the world a lot today is, is in, I think something to, to what Emily was saying too, that if you partner, if you only take like a tech firm partnership approach um, to, to, uh, to make sure that we avoid the risk of actually furthering exclusion. So like, I think as development actors, I think it's important to recognize that technology is not just an opportunity anymore. It's actually in many markets that we're interested in, it's become a kind of basic rail you need to function, right? Yeah. So like when you yeah. see the world of digital work and how much like gig platforms are beginning to exist and expand in markets like India, Indonesia, and like several others, Nigeria, you begin to see that it becomes this kind of currency and participation rail in at least the urban economies of these markets. So I think as development actors, and it's very easy because these markets are so big, like Google Pay, Paytm in India, they have like 500 million customers, right? So you imagine that scale, but actually there's huge amounts of exclusion underneath that. 
So I think to not underestimate the value of like basic digital identity, um, digital kind of smartphones and kind of a basic bank account as the rails with which I think low income communities can participate and improve their lives. And how can we as development actors not just think of our role in these markets as firm by firm partnership, but this overarching layer building that can allow then for that innovation to be um, not automatically inclusive, but a little more inclusive than they'd naturally be and not just serve the Indian upper middle class like me, right? I mean, today to, to its advantage, to its, um, to its, as a compliment, I would say like it's it's a big success story to see um, a, a, a service like Google Pay being used by a really small, you know, laundry person sitting on the sidewalk outside a big apartment complex. But that's a success story on many levels. Yes, it's a success story of Google and its innovators, but it's a success story of a market that has good digital rails that are reaching that person. And it's a success story of that innovation being intuitive enough to appeal to the customer of that laundry man and the laundry man and being okay to use by both of them in a way that's at least valuable, if not delight inducing. Mm. So I think those kinds of things are also important um, in addition to the real consumer risks that obviously finance can bring into any atmosphere. Yeah, I think, I think there's a, I think how we think about working with the private sector is different if the situation is there's nothing in the community that we are working in and working with, uh, then, you know, well, the scenario that you just described, maybe an urban setting where infrastructure rails are there, where a lot of times we forget that, uh, not everyone, but a lot of people do forget that we're not, as a development community, introducing technology or introducing yeah. these digital yeah. enabled business models in these communities, they're already there. Yeah. And so then it's a question of, okay, if a lot of people are already experiencing, experiencing or engaging the digital economy, are their livelihoods improving? Do they have any greater sense of agency? You know. And if not, then what are the things that we need to think about in addition for those kinds of communities? Um, Thomas, I was just going to... Yeah. Now, I was going to comment on, on the points that are raised. Uh, I think from a policy perspective, we are recognizing, as everybody has pointed out, that technology is no longer just applications we are talking about. It is now the operating system of society, Amen. almost the oxygen system of society, right? So if that's the case then, and that's the reason Secretary Blinken about six, eight months ago launched an entire bureau. And as you know, it's not easy to set up a whole new bureau. And, and, <laughs> but there's an entire new bureau, it's called Cyber Policy, that its task is to look at these issues that we're discussing and how do we then implement these, these in our bilateral, multilateral type of conversations. So emerging tech is no longer kind of the, the periphery of policy, but it has to be in the core of policy because of this operating system analogy that I've given. Um, and I wanted to come to the point about vendor per versus partnership. I always yeah. a partnership. <laughs> and because that's the first thing people talk about technologies like, is, and I'm not a procurement guy. I'm, I'm, the only thing I procure from organizations or companies is values. What value do you have that I can extract so we can collaborate together? So mm -hmm. I think it's an important point that you, you raised on that. Um, the other thing is, uh, it's, I see it here as, as the future of emerging technology, or you can actually say the future of development itself, right? So in that case, when you were talking about the future, but we're still stuck as development practitioners, we're still stuck with as if that the development community is the gods of development. Mm. We're not even a god anymore, mm. right? Because there is a new emerging uh, players that are emerging out of that. So and instead of asking the question, what is the solution for this development ill? We should be asking the question, what if? Which is a much more expansive viewpoint rather than what is. Which is, if you talk about the future, because there are no future facts. There are no future things that you can say that this is happening, right? Yeah. There is, and everything that we are talking about, and someone mentioned about Africa and other things, some of these technologies that we're now talking about, they've been around for the last 15, 20 years, right? Just because we discovered now, that doesn't mean they have not existed. There's an awesome, um, not quote, but a, a lyric in John Legend's song that says, the future started yesterday and we're already late. Mm. And the practitioners, we're already late. 
Yeah, I always would, late to that game. So, so I would agree we, we're playing catch up for sure, constantly. Yeah, so if Can, we, oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to grab onto something here that's been a theme in the last three comments, I think. Um, and forgive me, sorry, not sorry. The term innovation, I just want to pause on this for a second. Um, my, uh, my colleague, um, Sid Harrell, uh, recently wrote a book with an entire chapter uh, titled Innovation is a Flawed Framework for Change. And I love it. Um, and, and I want to point to this because innovation is about the cutting edge. It's about the future. It's about the next thing. But what about the now stuff, right? Like when we are figuring out again how to connect people, how to connect the unbanked, right, to the financial system, when we are figuring out how to build functional websites that can stand up with a lot of traffic, that is not innovation. Full stop. Also, doing that work effectively is a completely different set of skills than the tip of the spear, you know, future thinking stuff. The future thinking stuff requires a, a safe space to tinker. Mm -hmm. If you tinker with improving the current system in a safe space, you will fail. And the reason is because it will not plug into the existing system. You mm -hmm. cannot create something in a safe space free of the constraints of reality and then expect for it to work when it faces reality. That's not going to happen. And I just, I want to call attention to that because I think knowing is what I want to do and what we're working on here like really truly innovative or is it part of the operating system, right? Are we working with the operating system? Because as those of you who know technology, what you put at the top of the stack, what you put at the application layer that people will interact with depends entirely on what's underneath it. And to your point, Paul, like, and um, I'm so sorry, I forgot your name. Gayatri. Gayatri. To your point, people are already using this, right? You walk into these communities and one of the first asks should be, what are people already using? How are they using it? Yeah. What kinds of networks are they using? How stable are they, right? Like what, what infrastructure am I walking into? Because it's no longer true. The answer is nothing usually, right? So I just wanted to call attention to that. Well, no, I mean, and just on the, uh, on the innovations front, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's also the, question of um, how do you test out whether an innovation has, you know, knowing that there is value to having, you know, innovation figured out in some sort, some sort of a real world in a, in a setting, how can you construct an environment that does have some of those realities at play, but not also plant the seeds for harm? So I know WFP, obviously you think about that. You mentioned you have a process in place that helps you navigate those issues, identify them. Um, is there... Uh, is it harder to navigate that space with a private sector partner? Like, like, like do you often have to um, explain, here's the WFP approach to risk from an innovation perspective and the private sector counter, counter, counterpart or collaborator that you have um, gets it or recognizes it or, or do they tend to have a different approach? Are you kind of talking past each other? No, I think by and large, especially with larger partners, there definitely um, is an appreciation and a respect of the work that we're doing. And they do rely on us to provide sort of what are the boundaries of what is um, acceptable or not in terms of testing things out. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the innovation unit is in, in Germany, but we do have hubs uh, across um, all regions of the world. And one of the hallmarks of at least our program is when we're working with partners or especially startups, we do ask that the testing be done in the environment in which we want to use whatever solution is being considered. So um, we will always require that they partner one with a country office that uh, one of our own country offices and two with whichever community groups we're working with in the specific country. But I also want to highlight that when we start out on the innovation journey, we're not working with the core of, of our Amazing. infrastructure or the core of our programming, definitely not. And we do start very small. 
to make sure that we are testing assumptions more about the solution and or the product that we're we're considering without jeopardizing the actual core of the programming that's happening in the country. And in many cases, especially for the smaller startups that we work with, asking them to, to test or design or implement in any number of countries in which we work is too much of an ask. And a lot of times that's when we decide it's not a good collaboration. Uh, but to your point, I don't think it's like the innovation work that we do is such a small piece of the broader um, operational footprint of WFP. So, and, and I do agree with you that a lot of the infrastructure stuff, a lot of the just dealing with the now and dealing with the basic stuff of either getting people online or digital literacy or any number of, of technology related issues that are not cutting edge, that are not frontier, that are not emerging. There are massive needs there and they are being addressed. But there is an acknowledgement that the world is evolving and that we do need to dedicate a small piece of what we do, and that's the innovation unit, to look to see if these new technologies are relevant. Yeah. We're less than 1% of the entire budget of WFP. So yeah. we're not. And you know, just to clarify, like that is not to say I don't think, I think those things are all incredibly valuable, but it's the kind of thing similarly to the earlier conversation that I think we need to know it's important for practitioners to know where you are in that spectrum, right? Like, am I doing this cutting edge research, right? Am I doing work that is pushing the envelope or am I just trying to improve this existing system? And those, those require very different sort of operational models yep. and, and skill sets, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, can I mm -hmm. sure. add one last one? I'd be really curious to hear what Rebecca thinks about it too. Um, because of her work on the ground. And that is that um, I think at least my work has taught me that we have this assumption that either we as development actors or local firms, because they're local, know what low-income communities need. And I think this is a huge assumption, um, which is often not correct. Means I think we have a lot to learn as both types of partners here on how to serve this kind of next billion, whatever the segment you want to call them, of people coming online now um, or in the last 10 years and forward looking in the next 10 years. Because this is a segment that I think um, is where all those conversations of scale, as you were mentioning, I mean, break down, right? So like it has to be tech and touch models. Um, customer centricity means new things. Design thinking means new things. You don't just get a few low-income community members in a room and ask them what their credit product should look like. That's not how you do it. Um, you don't, you know, come up with, like, I think the techniques need to be different. There needs to be a humility on what, what works and what doesn't, and it has to be hugely iterative. I think that's what we're realizing in the work we're doing. I'd be really curious what Rebecca's experience tells her too. Can you weigh in on that, Rebecca, in uh, your work with the Common Voices Project? Sure, I think I think one key thing that often development actors kind of forget or put it at the back of their mind when they're kind of working is sort of evaluating the kind of tech firms that are out there and that are willing to collaborate and partner with development actors. Do they have something more than an economic case? Because often uh, every tech company has an economic case behind what they do, what products they push out. They have a reason behind how they're going to benefit financially. But what is the social case? So that's something that development actors need to definitely clearly evaluate when it comes to how they work with tech firms. Do they have a social case? Do they look at things such as diversity, equity, and inclusion? Do they look at the context and the community's need? Do they look beyond just the end that they're looking for, that the financial gain, but is what they're building or what they're working on something that will actually address the kind of challenges that the communities face? So for me, I think they also need to look at things like do they have things like collaborative governance? How well do they work around things like privacy, data governance? Do they think about all these concepts when they talk about innovation and how these communities will benefit from it? From my experience, when you try and expose people to participate in projects, let's say like the voice technology aspect of it, you find that people have reservations to specific things like as a company known as Mozilla, what are you benefiting out of what you're doing? So some of those things really need to come up front when you're considering how how these communities are benefiting from such kind of solutions. Thank you. Yeah, I think one, one general 
observation that I've had is that I think a lot of people in the development community don't have a great awareness or there's maybe not quite as much transparency as there should be on the business models that enable certain tech firms to offer the services that they do going to the mm -hmm. governance question yeah. that you rose, raised or the, the issue of how data is treated. And of course, data that might be sourced from that community. Could I, uh, we have, we're toward the end of the panel. So I wanted to at least give a, a couple of minutes to the audience to weigh in with questions or observations, or this is your chance to disagree and, and challenge the panelists if you do, or again, ask questions. So I, uh, I can see folks, if you want to raise your hand up and offer, offer a question, there's at least one over here, uh, feel free to do so. And then we'll, um, we'll do another round robin. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Andrew Patricio. I'm the, essentially the chief digital officer at Unidos US, which is a domestic organization. Um, but I used to work in DC government, um, leading various technology at different agencies. And one thing I, I noticed is that um, you, when we talk about innovation and there's this sort of, in my opinion, a myth that private sector is, is innovative. I think when they, when they engage with government, they get very hidebound. You know, they get very contractually oriented. Like what's the requirement? What's the deliverable? And they get fixed on that. And it's hard to have a conversation about how you be more experimental, how you be more iterative, because they want to say, what are you going to pay me for? And what do I deliver? And what am I going to be held accountable for? And so I was wondering if you guys had any insight into, like we're talking about partnering, partnering with tech firms here, how do you sort of get tech firms to be a little bit more risky in terms of, yeah, we don't have a specific deliverable, but you're still going to get paid or, you know, whatever you want to put. So I'll let, uh, feel free to raise your hand and then we'll uh, get an, over here. We have another uh, person that just raised a hand and then would someone like to take that? Question? Yeah, for sure. Um, procurement, I live and breathe it. Um, like the root of so many problems. <laughs> um, the short answer, I think, in, in my mind, it has to do with um, framing the agreement and the work in terms of a very clear outcome and defining what success looks like and what the indicators of success are and doing so in a way and then crafting the rest of it essentially as an exploration, right? And saying, your job is to help me figure out how to get this. What's the best way to get it? Maybe it's an app. Maybe it is taking a form that is impossible to understand and rewriting it. I don't know, you know? Um, but I think that, I think a lot of it comes down to the outcome. To my mind, I'm curious if anyone else has anything. I mean, one know. nuance I might parse here is that when it comes to procurement, then I find tech companies are very prescriptive, right? Because there are contractual legal obligations that they have to fulfill. When it comes to partnership, there's a lot more yep. flexibility, flexibility and a lot more creativity. It doesn't mean that you still don't need to have clear roles and responsibilities because it can get messy but they have a lot more um, freedom to move and operate and, and be creative because they're not bound by these very rigid procurement rules and regulations. So I have found, at least on the partnership side of things, um, tech companies are a lot more creative in helping us troubleshoot different solutions for whatever problem we are presenting them with. But if I may know, the, the burden of risk is really not in the private sector when it comes to this question. It's mostly on the government. Paul and I know that we talk a lot of big game about being innovative and all of that, but we are the most risk averse. We think everything we touch turns to gold, yeah. as if we have a Midas touch. We don't. But to acknowledge that with humility, saying these things, what we're getting into, will have failures. And we're embracing that as a huge appetite. We don't have the appetite right now. And I think so, and instead, instead of saying the tech companies do not have the appetite, we have to say both sides might not have the appetite to do so. And how do you create uh, some level of enabling environment mm -hmm. that encourages that? Because as, as, as folks who are of responsibility in deploying taxpayers' money, how do you take risk that might not be undue or due in that sense? So, so okay. I, don't know. I have one more thing to add to this right. real quick. Okay, talk. Is <laughs> that in hot take, hiring a vendor often is outsourcing risk, yeah. number one. Number two, to Rebecca's point, when we don't include communities and don't take a, an approach that is rooted in the needs of people, 
and a deep understanding of the problem space, you are more likely to fail. And what I think is useful in these moments is using that as an opportunity, um, like setting those up to craft it in a way that better ensures those outcomes. And last thing is all the beltway bandits are the ones that are the most guilty of that behavior. If you go to medium and smaller size firms, they know how to do this themselves and they don't have to outsource it 70,000 layers. So we um, promised hard conversations. <laughs> <laughs> one, so here you go. Saved it for the end. <laughs> um, but, but really like if you want people that can operate more on outcomes, go smaller. So I think you abused your quick comment. No, I just want to echo her something. Sure. I love what you said. <laughs> people are greater than product. Yeah. yeah. The problem with these yeah. risk issues is product based. People are greater than yeah. product. Right. Uh, go ahead. You've been very patient. Barely. And then there was another question to the left as well. Looks like there's another question to the left. Uh, I don't know if you also already have your microphone, and if so. Yeah. There you go. No, so um, my, my question, uh, I had a question and a comment to, to WFP, um, uh, but uh, so the question was around um, how do you manage reputational risk when, when partnering with, um, with the private sector? And, and in particular, when you, when, you, when you partner with large uh, private sector, I mean, I, uh, I guess WFP Innovation Labs, um, you were saying that you normally, you know, you, you start small, and you, you work with local ecosystem players. Um, but from what I understand, obviously, there is a lot other innovation that happens in WFP as an example. Uh, I'll take the example of the uh, hunger map, for instance. And the hunger map, I think when it was developed uh, with, with support from Alibaba, uh, I think it was a huge innovation in, in, its, in its own way, and it continues to be an innovation in terms of, uh, you, know, you know, leveraging data for strategic decision making. But of course, Alibaba is a large, you know, private sector organization, uh, uh, and there are, I suppose, reputational risks associated with it. Now, you can decide, you know, to do something about it or not, uh, if there is indeed a reputational risk and everything else is, is fine. Uh, but there's also an, a, an implication of doing nothing uh, because of a re potential reputational risk. Sure. So I wonder how, sure. how you guys you know, navigate uh, this, this, this situation when, when it happens. And, and of course, it applies to WFP, but it applies to any international NGO in the humanitarian yeah. or development sector that is looking to develop these uh, partnerships as sure. opposed to vendor relations. Thanks. Yeah, and I recognize we're already running low. So, Kiriakis, if you could address that. So, reputational risk in particular with established firms, and then uh, we'll shift to a brief round, Robin. Yeah, so reputational risk is something we do take into account, not just the innovation unit, but across the board. And we do have an extensive due diligence process um, that is managed both by our legal division as well as our partnerships division. And for anything that may raise red flags, we have an executive committee that will then weigh in on whether or not that partnership or the value of that partnership is commensurate to whatever reputational risk may be involved. And to be quite honest, especially for the work that we do at the Innovation Accelerator, a lot of the delays we encounter is due to this due diligence process, which needs to happen. But again, it's not commensurate to the small scale in which we operate. So that's also something that you have to consider is your due diligence process commensurate to the scale of the partnership? And, and if not, then can you be a bit more creative depending on what that partnership scope of work is intended to be? Thank you. So I know you're just about to say something. Hopefully it'll some, be something that you can integrate into the <laughs> final, final round, final Robin. Process. We'll see. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. <laughs> so so um, yeah. What, well, so the, so, the, yeah. so the final round, Robin, is uh, one word. If someone comes to you and says, hey, I work at a development organization. I work at the World Bank. I work at a humanitarian group. Uh, I work uh, I work at USAID or I work at the Red Cross, wh whatever the case may be. Um, a tech firm approached me and they want to partner. What's the one word bit of guidance that you would give? And what's the sentence explaining that word? Okay, yeah, I can do it <laughs> with, the, with the answer to your question as well. Um, so in my work, I actually sit on the Sustainability Council of, of GoTo in Indonesia, which is a huge platform. Um, Mercado Pago sits on our board of the, of the little unit of the bank that I work in. Um, and uh, we partner, I'm currently piloting a credit product that's going to Uber drivers in, in Mumbai. 
So big tech is a big thing of what I think about. And I think the one word I would say about what, what I try to remember, maybe phrase, is why I am in the room. There's nothing wrong in being in the room with a big tech firm that, um, you know, potentially um, is such a large firm that it has great risks. There's nothing wrong in being in the room with them. I think it's to remember why you're in the room with them. And if you're in the room to create an inclusive and more sustainable market or community, then you remain focused on that. And when that ceases to happen, you walk away and you walk out of the room. Um, so I think that's what I would say as a last comment. I, I think you mostly follow the rules there. Uh, Rebecca, could I go to you for your one word, a bit of guidance for someone if they came to you with that question? Sure. And then I think I'll go. explaining it. Sure, I think I'll go with what uh, the speaker from WFP spoke about, due, due diligence. I think uh, development actors really need to do their due diligence before partnering with tech firms. Look at the reputation of these uh, tech firms, how they've worked with communities, look at how they're addressing things such governance of data, how are they working towards uh, building something that actually works for the society, but at the same time, how are they addressing the risk that some of their products pose out to their communities? So I think for me, the greatest part for them would be they need to do uh, their work. They need to do the part. They need to do the due diligence to come up to a point where they understand this kind of tech firms that we're partnering with. What do they bring to the table and how will it benefit the kind of society or the people that we represent? Yeah, thank you. Kyriakos? Um, I would say think big. Um, and what, what I mean by that is it takes a lot of work to get these partnerships off the ground. So make sure it's worth the while. And also, I think private sector needs to do a lot more, especially tech companies. And so be a lot more demanding of them. So far, no one's following the rules, but let's see if uh, Emily can do so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Go ahead, Emily, your, your stab at okay, it. Okay, let's see this pressure. Um, all right, I'll go with why for a different reason. Um, and that is like, what's the outcome, right? Like, why are you doing this? Why do you want to work with them? What is the outcome you are seeking to achieve? And baked in there is, I think, something I would love for people to carry with them. To my mind, the goal of working with technology and bringing technology in, success means Technology does what technology is good at and humans do what humans are good at. And humans are inherently good at like high touch, complicated, more sort of like emotionally oriented problem solving. Um, and technology can rinse and repeat. It can do, it can do things at scale. Um, so I think that to me, it's like the why in order to answer that question. How do you use tech to do what tech is good at? Humans, humans are good at. Thanks. Last up, Thomas. I don't know if I'm following your rules, but uh, it is a word, but it's a made up word that I made. It's yes. called, the word is called flagnostic. Flagnostic. Flagnostic, which means is that most companies and organizations come to a problem with their own set of solutions, with their flag. But unfortunately, wicked global problems around the world do not have a deadly, do not have a flag, whether it's climate change, whether it's poverty and all that, but we tend to come at it where saying my company or my organization have that solution. And to be, to be completely humble, no, you do not have the solution for everything. So therefore come at it with a phlegnostic approach, be militantly faithful to the problem you're trying to solve, but be phlegnostic to the solution that might need. Great, on that, we'll say thanks for the panelists and thanks for indulging us on taking uh, more time than we had. Thank you. Thank you.